This podcast is proud to be part of the Blueberry Network. That's blueberry with no ease dot com. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Transpersonal Radio with Angela Lynn Gibson. Remember, your thoughts upload your reality. Think wisely and always prepare to ignite. Welcome, Welcome to Transpersonal Radio. Transpersonalradio.com. Real talk for real life. Inspiring podcasts. Exploring personal empowerment. empowerment. And transformation. Through parapsychology, spirituality, and how your thoughts Up. upload your reality. And now your host, Angela, Angela L. Gibson. Hello, Transpersonal Radio listeners. Tonight's guest, Linda Summers, is passionate about changing the consciousness of humanity by awakening individuals to see their own truth. She is a radio show host, TV show personality, speaker, author, and mentor. She has provided presentations to Rotary Clubs, women's organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, and corporations. She has also coached law firm, and editorial magazine employees. Linda's special gift is her ability to help people shift their perspective, thereby creating more peace and joy in their lives. She does this by shedding light on a person's concepts, ideas, thoughts, and helping people to heal their own inner reflection. Linda believes that everyone walks his or her own path and that every experience is an opportunity to learn and to evolve. She arrived at this stage of life through her outer journey as a life coach and mentor, interviewer, host, and motivational speaker. Through her inner journey of breaking through personal fears, releasing and letting go of things that no longer served her and that were blocking her own truth, she was able to raise her consciousness, find peace, and discover her passion. Linda hosts Conscious Talk Radio, her show on Block Talk Radio that has over 26,000 listeners. Linda says, we have entered into a new consciousness, one that is about oneness, unity, and love. The only way we are going to make a difference in the world is if we make the difference. It begins with us and how we are being and what we are putting out there mentally, emotionally, and physically. It's time to wake up. It is my intention and commitment to humanity to raise the consciousness and shift one's awareness to awaken, to find truth, be empowered from truth, and in revealing truth, find happiness. Now, I met Linda recently at the New Earth Expo in San Diego, California, and she is just delightful. I am so excited to have her on the show this evening. Linda, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Thank you so much, Angela. I am so glad to be here, and thank you to all the listeners that are tuning in. Thank you. Now, we're going to talk tonight about the topic of being seen and heard. Yes. And we all know, uh, and especially people our age, you know, I, I know for a fact um, I was uh, raised by my grandparents for a certain period of time. And, and it definitely was the moniker of be seen and not heard. Children were to be seen mm. and not heard. So a lot okay. of us, you know, yeah, a lot of us grew up that way. And uh, so I'm really interested in your perspective on this topic because uh, you also have personal experience with that. Now, you were the middle child of seven children. Is that right? Yes, right in the middle. Right in the middle. And that's a large family. Yes. And that's what it, the, for me, it was really about I wasn't seen and heard. You know, it was just kind of like, hey, I'm here and, you know, pay attention to me. So it was really trying to get the attention from my parents. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is it wasn't necessarily in your household of, of uh, children should be seen and not heard. You were just sort of invisible altogether, lost in the crowd, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I was real, I'm 11 months from my brother. So having two children and there, there was other kids above us, I had three other siblings above us, besides my brother. And so it was very difficult to, you know, be there and have to get the attention from my, my mom, because she was so busy with all the other kids, because we were so really all close together in age. And so it was very difficult. So yeah, it was definitely um, for really all of us. But I feel that for me, it was probably more of an impact um, than it did my siblings. Yeah, and you know it's interesting because we hear a lot. Uh, there, there are a lot of psychological studies about, uh, you know, the eldest sibling versus the youngest sibling versus mm-hmm. the middle siblings, and all of the different 
um, impacts that that does have on each of the different children. And I can imagine for you now what I've heard a lot, and you can tell me about your experience because see, I was uh, I, I have half siblings, but I actually grew up as an only child because we didn't really grow up together. So, um, but I've I've heard you know by talking to a lot of people throughout the years that oftentimes the middle child has some of the most difficulty because they have a lot of well they're they're sort of lost in that the parents don't have time and they don't take the same amount of effort that they take with the first child so that right. being right so that yeah. being the eldest child mm-hmm. then they also seem oftentimes to have even more responsibility as uh becoming even a caretaker of the younger children right was that mm-hmm. your experience no, it was not. No, I didn't have to for the younger ones, which was just really the, the dynamics in my family was just very interesting in the fact of how I perceive. And I think this is really important for the listeners to um, really hear because I think this is or I feel this is really where if we can have this understanding and that's really where my work comes in about shifting people's perspective is in realizing that we kind of make up these stories like for me, not any of my siblings don't feel this at all, but I felt like, gosh, I was never seen and heard, right? So that was kind of my story of what how I felt. They felt other things that were different than me. And so what I realized, though, that it was a blessing for my parents not to see me and not to hear me because of having the radio show and, and being really in the media, but having a voice and really being seen. And what I mean by that and it's important to really express this as well, is that it's really being seen for who we are. It's almost if you would unzip that person and you can see the soul and then having the voice to be able to share our message, our gift to the world, Mm -hmm. to really use that. That's how I saw after, you know, years of diving into my own self and my own journey of realizing and, and growth and evolution to see, wow, this whole thing about that the story I made up of not being seen and heard Mm -hmm. was really for my benefit and how I am now out there in the radio, in media and doing things that where I am very visible, but also being heard is really giving my message. Mm -hmm. You know, and you bring up a really great point, Linda, when, and we're going to get into this a little bit more as we go throughout the show However, you mentioned something that really struck me, which is your story, your perception. And it's interesting yeah. because we all have different perspectives and sometimes yes. we have misperceptions. And mm-hmm. so we're going to address that as we continue uh, this evening. I want to circle back now. As you had all these experiences growing up, obviously you had a pretty strong indication of what you didn't want, as well as what you were looking for. And you're now the proud mom of of three boys. You're raising three sons. What are some of the things you're doing differently with them than what your parents did with the seven of you? Great question. Um, Raising my kids was really important because I actually started coaching at that time. Um, My It was back in the 90s, so my youngest was just born in 93, And what I had learned through the coaching and really on my own journey and really diving deep within myself and just allowing me to be the creative expression of who I was, was allowing them to be their creative expression for them to have a voice. And what I really realized with my three kids, because even as a mom, we can still get caught up in that. And it's like, well, I have the say so. And, you know, you're (laughs) not going to get your ears pierced. You're not going to do this. You're not going to do that. But what I what I what I did differently was I I let them go ahead and share what they wanted and found out why they wanted it and why it was important to them. And then I put my spin on it as for where I'm coming from. And we kind of compromised in a way of, okay, when you turn 18, you can do this. But really what I did, I gave them choices. Beautiful. And I allowed them to be their own creative expression. I remember one time um, my son was, my middle son was in uh, middle school. And I picked him up in front of the school and I was in, I had a little red Z and, you know, I picked him up. I had the top down and he was like crawling basically to the car. He was like, oh my gosh, I don't want to get in this car. And he goes, 
you know what? Can't you dress like all the other mothers? Can't you be like all the other mothers? And I said, you know what? I'm not like all the other mothers and you're not like all the other kids. And I said, what I, for you, I could tell you to wear your hat straight. I could tell you to pull your pants up and tuck your shirt in, but that's not how you express yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? So what I gifted with them really of allowing them to be the creative expression. And I also saw how, they did things and what they were doing. So I kind of knew one was going to be in building. One was going to be more in exploring. So I really paid attention, you know, to what they were sharing with me and really involved myself in them. But I feel it was mostly really listening and allowing them to have a voice. Outstanding. That is fantastic. Yeah. Most of your message, well, Linda, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, there's one thing I wanted to share in that and what I realized that I started to say, and I just, I, I kind of went over it, was in raising my kids, what I realized was, even though I'm their parent and, and I did allow them to have a voice, as a mother, they did not want to share things like that they, you know, that I would, um, you know, make them come in at a certain time. It was like who, what, where, and when it was like, you got to grill me every time. And so what I'm saying is they didn't, they needed to have an outlet, someone to talk to. And I think that's where kids with, if, as even as a parent, you can listen and all, you know, you can be their best friend. You can listen and you can allow them to have a voice, but they still, they're not going to come to you for every well, I want to say that's really the truth because my kids do come for me for to quite, you know, they come to me for quite a bit, but um, I'm kind of a different parent too. But I think that what I'm really saying is I feel that a lot of kids aren't going to go to their parents and say, you know what, I hate you. And, you know, I wish you were never my parents. And, you know, they don't want to hurt their parents' feelings or maybe the kids do and the parents, you know, take it personally. Mm -hmm. So what I'm really saying is that I feel that all these kids that get into trouble is because they're not being seen and heard. They're mm -hmm. not being allowed to have a voice and being seen for really who they are. We're just shutting them down saying, you know, don't be funny in school. Don't, you know, mm -hmm. don't do this. Don't do that. Don't cry. And we're just, we're just kind of dousing their lights. Well, it's the old author authoritarian Right. Uh, management of children. And uh, as we know, that can be fairly damaging and certainly not productive. Right. An interesting topic. Your whole premise is helping people find their truth. And we're going to do a deep dive into that. I want to yes. ask you something before we do that, that I've run into multiple times that I find discombobulating, concerning, and uh, it, it's something that I don't really personally understand completely because I happen to be someone who says I would rather know the truth than a lie even if the truth hurts I would rather have the truth right but mm -hmm. I've had people in my life who have actually said to me Angela some of us don't want to know the truth I've actually mm -hmm. had I've actually had people say that to me because I've been accused of being sometimes too abrupt or too forward or too direct some you know we don't want to hear that and I'm just thinking, are you out of your minds? And I've had people say to me, we've constructed our reality the way we like it, and that's the way we want to live it. We don't, we don't want the truth. What? How do you handle that? What do you have to say about that, Linda? Well, and I look at the truth. Well, I shouldn't say what I was going to say is I look at the truth a little bit different. But how I would in that respect, I think that people, um, they get in the comfort zone mm -hmm. and they're comfortable yeah. where they are. And to disrupt that, it's almost like here you're going along the road and all of a sudden you have an earthquake that rocks your world and that doesn't feel good. And it's like, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle life now? Mm -hmm. You know, what, am, am I going to die? And I think that this is what people are feeling when people say that, that it's like, well, I like where I'm at. I don't need to know the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable where I'm at. And really what I'm saying and diving into the truth, it, it could, it, it really could be the truth of humanity, the truth that's really, that's out there. I mean, if we look at everything that the commercials and the TV, all of that mm -hmm. is programming, right? Absolutely. Programming us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The schools are programming. So, you know, to me, it's like, 
that would be a great truth to get out there. Mm -hmm. When I'm working with people, it's more of diving into their own truth, meaning what is true for you. In this situation, let's say you're in a relationship and you are not happy and fulfilled in this relationship, but it's comfortable. It's the only thing you know. You're going to lose your fi you know, financial freedom. You're going to lose a lot of things, and that's pretty scary just mm -hmm. to step out on going, okay, my happiness is more important than this. So what I would do with that person is really diving in and saying, the tr what is your truth? The truth is you're not happy and fulfilled, right? And so what are your beliefs around all of that? So what, is what does happiness mean to you? What does being fulfilled mean to you? And I think once we, fee we, once we step into knowing our own truth, and the truth is I'm not happy, and my, this is my fear, and we allow that truth to come up, now we have a choice. We're given every single moment there's a choice. And we make that choice, not that it's wrong or right, but we make that choice. And from that choice, it's how we perceive that choice to be. You know what I mean? I do. So mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of truth that we can talk about and, and truth of humanity, like I said, and then truth of oneself and mm -hmm. really diving in. Are your beliefs your beliefs? You know, we have a lot of beliefs that were instilled from our parents, from society, from yes. churches, from a lot of things, right? And so at some point in our lives, and I did this with my kids, they were probably, I would say about 13 or 14, and I said to them, here's all my beliefs. You write out your beliefs and see if they serve you. If they don't serve you, if my beliefs don't serve you, then change your beliefs, you know what I mean? And that may be too young to be doing it, but I felt here they're coming into um, an age and a, uh, a place of puberty and really coming into their own and defining who they are in this world, right? Trying to fit in, you know, into the world and where do I fit in in school and things like this. So I think it's really important that we start asking them, what are your beliefs? Are you taking on my beliefs? And so when we get to the truth of that and to the truth of really who are we, what makes Linda happy, what brings Linda joy, what makes Linda fulfilled, what is Linda fearful of, and all of that, when we get to that truth and then having it surface and then making a choice from there, that's really what I'm talking about is truth. But again, I think it's really important as far as humanity that we bring the truth out there too. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing you say is when you're coaching someone or you are facilitating, guiding someone into finding their truth or their message, their vision, their purpose, one of the first steps you have them complete is to write out their current set of beliefs as they understand them. Yes, yes, exactly. And really writing out and answering a lot of questions like, you know, um, first of all, why would they even hire a relationships coach, right? And so, and what does that look like to them? And what are they gaining? What do they want to gain from that? And where are they at right now? Are they in a relationship? Or are they in a business that, that um, a career that they're not happy with, right? And the truth is, they're not really happy. But I the the excuse or the verbiage is, but I have to do this. Right. And, you know, to me, it's like, ah, oh, but, you know, you, I wouldn't say quit that job or leave that relationship right away. I mean, you really have to, you got to really dive deep within that, that person's life. And, you know, it's not making those quick decisions. It's them making the decisions. You're just helping them to, see what they can't see. And that's really what I'm doing. I'm not saying this is what I think you should do. I'm actually asking the questions of them to bring it to the surface so they can see it. And then saying, now that you can see this, you have the choice to make. Here's something interesting that I've observed as well. And I want to get your take on it in having dealt with this. When you have been in a situation where you've been coaching, you know, you've, you've coached it law firms and editorial magazines, yep. so you've corporations, you've done workshops. When you have people come to you, whether it's a romantic, intimate relationship or whether it's a work relationship, and someone says to you, you know, this is my truth, this is what's happening, and then someone jumps in and says, what? That's not, that's not what's going on at all. This is what's happening. 
how do you manage those perceptions that are that seem to be completely at odds with one another one person and they're living the same reality but they have a completely different perspective of what's happening how do you unwind that so are you talking about in an intimate relationship where the, there's two partners and one is saying, this is my truth, and the other one's saying, no way, that's not the truth. This is sure. what I really see. That- it could be intimate relationship or work relationship even. But, you know, relationships between a couple people, three, four people that are involved in, and exactly, they have a completely different perspective on what's happening. Well, then that's the key right there. They have a completely different perspective on what's happening because we are all going to have a different perspective based upon our own experiences and that filter through and how we perceive that to be. Because what's one truth of one person may not be the truth of another. But I feel when we dive into truth, truth is truth. Mm -hmm. We have to be truthful with ourselves. So if that person let's just say they are in a business, right? And this is what was happening in this corpor- um, in this uh, law firm and the corporation that I was um, coaching in is that, you know, it was one person seeing this and the other person going, no, 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 that's not what I, you know. And so it's really having the understanding of how each one operates. So you're talking to each one and they're allowing their own truth to come up. That person can see their truth, right? then they can see the other truth. So it's like having all these truths because we're all such unique individual people. We've experienced different things through our lives that we're going to have different truths and they're going to see it completely different. But it's when we can see another person and what they're saying and be able to honor that, right? As opposed to saying, well, that's not how I Mm -hmm. see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think when you, yeah, when you allow each one, whether it's intimate or in a business, when you allow each person to express, and this is where being seen and heard comes in, because now I'm being so vulnerable in front of my coworkers and my husband, right? And to be heard speaking my own truth, oh my gosh, like this can be very uncomfortable because if I speak my truth, what are they going to think of me? Yep, exactly. And exactly. And that's what it really boils down to. So, you know, and then when you really, but then I would say to that, if we try to get everyone's opinion on everything, <laughs> it's just, we're going we're gonna to get so many different opinions, right? <laughs> yes. And it's really having the understanding, like I said, of knowing that that is your truth. This is your truth. And seeing all of that of how can we all work together given that this person has that truth and this person has that truth. So it's establishing what's going on, right? And, yes. you know, maybe some one person uh, needs to be in the marketing department and not in the admin department, right? You know, so there's a whole lot of things that you can, you know, move people around. You find where their strengths and their weaknesses are. And, you know, just in like in a relationship, one person may be great with the billing and the other person's not. So, you know, you kind of balance that out where finding who has the strength of what and then you work together. It's all it's all relationships. So you're going to always be working together because we're always constant relating to life and to people on the streets, whether we know them or not. We're in constant relationship. Yes, exactly. In your experience, Linda, what ways have you seen people block their own truth? What kinds of mental gymnastics do they do? or What, what have you commonly come into contact with with people who are just blocking out their own truth? Oh, gosh. Well, that's true. A lot of people, it's like, yeah, they don't want to. Again, I feel it's really um, being vulnerable. It's being transparent. We don't want to be transparent. We don't want to be vulnerable because people will see who we are. And what I say to the people that, that I've crossed paths with that and clients is that, you know what, but how can we be in life and not being really who we are? Because when we show up, as who we are and be the frequency of that, then we attract that of which we, you know, vibrate at, right? Exactly. And so when we're out in the world and we're, you know, not being in our own truth and we're kind of like playing small, so to speak, and we're trying to out there to be big in the world, but we're not able to do that. It's not until we own who we are and own our own truth and be able to be transparent. And I think, I feel that's really where 
we've really lost touch in the world of not being able to have connected relationships, whether it be business, our children, our partner, our, you know, um, husband, could be a significant partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, is because we, we're so afraid of having another person see who we are because maybe they won't like us. But the thing is, I tell them that maybe they will like you. Maybe they'll love you even more of who you are when they find out. Because I was, trust me, everything that I'm telling you, I was there. I was playing small. I was so invisible because I w didn't want other pe you know, people to see really who I was. And once I broke that and allowed myself to really be in my own truth and show up, when I made a decision, my son said to me, I've never seen you like this before. I've never seen you so happy. Oh. Because I just, I realized in that moment, it was like, I needed to be Linda. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be me. And people just want to be who they are. But I feel through childhood that, you know, they've been squished mm -hmm. or through their relationships and their marriages they've been squished and really have been pounded down and belittled and whatever's happening. Right. And that mm -hmm. they feel small and they feel inadequate. And so we really want to bring them up and give them and, and have them see the truth of who they are, see the beautiful person, whether it be male or female to see the really true soul of this person. Agreed. And I, I think another thing that's been going on is all of the societal indoctrinations and media who have influenced how people perceive themselves or perceive who they should be, or especially, you know, I notice a lot of the reality television shows or these television shows that people follow or look up to, then they try to emulate those people and become those people instead of becoming themselves. Right. Now, how do you feel society and media have positively and negatively influenced people's concepts, perceptions, and truth? Well, I don't think, I don't feel they've done justice. I don't think they've done anything positive in the light of, um, of really representing anyone. I feel that um, it's more about ratings, numbers, as opposed to really who that person really is. I mean, look, we look at all the celebrities. I mean, we're out here in California, so Hollywood is very close in, to us. And so, you know, we hear a lot of the things that are happening. You know, you see the different stars that are making it big, but they're dying inside. Right. You know, there, there's this, it's again, it's a, it's a competition or whatever's happening with them to try and compete with you know, trying to be the number one, you know, musician or the number one song and things like this. And I feel that when we allow our status to become, and I think that's where the media has, you know, built everybody up, but doesn't really tell the truth and of really what's going on, you know, Agreed. I mean, maybe there's a little bit, but I, I don't know. I just feel that the media really hasn't done justice. And I feel that if we could really all be transparent and really say how we really feel and speak the truth, you know, it's interesting. I was at an event one time and this guy said, you know, we were in the elevator with people, right? And everybody's just staring at the walls <laughs> and we're so afraid to say, hi, how are you? Right. You know, or, and just say, or maybe you're interested in somebody and instead of saying, well, how's the weather outside? And then instead of, let's say, you know what? I find you really attractive or I would love to go out with you. Really speak and speak the truth mm -hmm. because that could have been an opportunity missed or, you know, just not to say anything and just to be, you know, just going about in our own world and not connecting or not relating to anybody. So I, I just feel that the, the media really needs to shift in there and really – show what's happening with other people and out in the world, what's really going on. You know, I think that's all, there's a whole, I think, back scenes with, that's going on with that. I agree. And in, in my opinion, I also believe the media needs to shift away from, and I, I, this leads into society as a whole as well, all of the negative or drama that, that has to be shown it, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, that whole kind of thing where 
they have to create artificial conflict in reality right. shows. They have to create all this artificial drama. That says something about consciousness as a whole right now where we need healing and we need shifting because really that just feeds that feedback loop of negativity and it's not healthy. Absolutely not. No. And then what we do is we create more of that. So with the media creating all of this negative and really speaking of the negative, we're only feeding that. And then, you know, the whole, these, all these reality shows like the Kardashians and, you know, all the ones that are out there to me, I look at that and I think, gosh, we are sending such a mixed message to the children, exactly, letting them see what is happening, and then they think that that's what's supposed to happen. I mean, exactly. we look at look at the marriage rate. The kids are not getting married. They're 34, 40 years old. Some met people are 50 years old and not getting married because it's like, oh my gosh, well, I don't want to fall into the category, you know, of uh, of a divorce or we've got technology that has disconnected us. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that once if we if the people can realize that when they get caught up in the media and all of that's being posted, like especially with the uh, politics and all that's going on, the more we have conversations around that that are in what the media is presenting, like you said, we're going to feed that as opposed to saying what we really truly want and desire and shift that around to that and seeing what we want and putting that out there as opposed to what we don't want. Because when we say what we're not wanting, that's what exactly what we're going to be getting. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's circle back. We touched on this a little bit earlier. I want to sort of flesh it out a little bit more. When we're talking about varying perspectives and even misperceptions, oftentimes when they're – is conflict in relationship it can come from varying perspectives or a complete misperception or miscommunication let's talk about some of those traps that you've seen and how you would handle that yeah miscommunication i mean it, this goes to really to the whole technology of texting if we're texting people that can be that can get so misconstrued because you you have no idea what the person's mean. You know what you're what you're meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And even if it wasn't through a text, even if it's through a com, you know what you're saying. And the beauty of having someone in front of you that you communicate to, you can tell by their body language. But if you're through a text or through the phone, you have no idea unless there's the silence goes, you know, and things like that. So again, what I would go back to and and telling people that. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Yes. Speak your truth and allow, but when we speak our truth, it's coming from our heart because we know when we're in, when we are in an intellectual conversation, but when we come from the heart and we say, you know, this is what you said to me, this is what was said and, and try not to use you really say I, right. And if you can really you know, um, because when we say you said this, then it feels like it's blaming them. And, you know, we know that's not really the truth, but it's like, this was what I heard. And this is what I'm feeling of what was said. And I'm not sure if that's what you meant, but I, it, can you give me clarity? Yeah. And exactly. then you start having, because communication is key. And unless we're communicating and let, pe letting people know, you know, what's happening, these misperceptions is because, we're not communicating and we can pretty much tell, you know, if we're, if we've said something to someone and we don't hear from them, then we kind of know something's going on and it's really up to us to reach out and say, Hey, you know, I haven't heard from you in a while. And, you know, I'm wondering if maybe, you know, you misunderstood something that I said, but you know, again, people, I mean, I'm guilty of this in my, and earlier on, you know, not, not now, but you know, I would shut down. That was my way of, I, I would get hurt and I would just shut down and not communicate. Well, that's very unproductive. Yes. You yeah. know, we, we don't get anywhere there. And then, you know, you really have to, you know, what just came to me too is like if you're at a job and you're typing for, the, for your boss, that you're typing up this letter that's supposed to go out to the corporation 
and there's a mistake on there and you didn't catch it and your boss didn't catch it and it goes out, right? And it comes back. He's going to be all over you, right? Because it, here's a mistake that you didn't catch, but he didn't catch it either, right? So I don't know if that really kind of makes sense, but what I'm saying is that if he, instead of really getting down on you and really, you know, raising havoc with you of, okay, you, you sent this out and it didn't go out very well, you know, and, and it had a mistake on it. It's more of, okay, you know what? We both, it's really taking the responsibility for both of you because he didn't catch it. You didn't catch it. That's probably not a really good analogy, but I'm just trying to give people an idea that it's really, we have to communicate with one another. Exactly. You know, we can't just assume. I think it's important, too, to bring up self-accountability, however, because there Absolutely. also is a lot of blame. It, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a typical martyr behavior or a victim behavior, and that also is not productive. So being able to step up and take blame when it's due mm -hmm. and also not taking on all the blame because right. that's the other thing that people do. So just mm -hmm. being able to own up to your piece. Mm-hmm but not over accepting responsibility is important as well. Absolutely. And I think that people can, um, if we start asking ourselves, this is where truth is coming in. You know, I had an incident with a friend and um, she was having a rough time, but I didn't know that. And she had sent me, you know, wanting to go out and, and I, I was, I was just really busy and couldn't. And so she was just like, okay, well, I guess that means you don't want to be friends. We're just going to move on and I'm, I'm done with all of this. And I was like, where's that coming from? Wow. And so I knew that that was not about me. So that's why I'm telling the people, you, you the story and the listeners, mm -hmm. because I knew that was, had nothing to do with me. Right. And so when I found out afterwards, after I sent that message to her, she sent back saying, you know, I've been really stressful and things have been going on in my life. And I, I realized, you know, I was just, you know, venting and whatever. So, you know, it is about taking responsibility for our own stuff. And if we know that we were the ones that were not in communication or not in our truth or whatever that looks like for you, you take responsibility. That's one aspect. But then if something else happens, like in this situation where something happened and it really had nothing to do with you, Right. But it had to do everything with that person. But it's still reaching out to that person and saying, you know, this doesn't feel like it has anything to really do with me. What's going on? And this is where we're talking from the heart. Right. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Like what's happening with, you know, or is it, you know, is your job OK? Is your relationship OK? Is everything all right? So that's where we're, we're coming into communication again. We're coming and speaking our truth. What's coming up for us? Linda, what would you say is the most challenging area people face when trying to shift their perspective? We talked about this a little bit earlier where people get into a comfort zone. They don't like change. People do not like change until it gets so uncomfortable that there's no other choice. So we know that. From your experience, what have you seen to be the most challenging area in getting people to really shift their perspective? Gosh, there's probably so much. I would say probably, I would say in relationships, in intimate relationships, um, you know, because we, we're such unique individuals, but yet we're together, right? And we're trying to do this dance and not being able to see what we can see or be transparent or be vulnerable. So I would have to say it's really in relationships that I find people have a hard time shifting their perspective. Um, and the, the other thing I think too is in the world, I think to um, having people instead of seeing the war and the, the crime and just, just the things that are happening out in the world. Yes, that's really happening. But instead of seeing that to see something much different, again, it goes back into, you know, feeding into the energy. And so we want to, if we want to see good in the world, then we have to, you know, look at the good in the world. We have to shift our perspective as to what we see. But I would say relationships is probably the most um, that I've probably seen because it's very difficult when you're with so close with someone it and, 
Yeah. And now what, so if you could name one or two or even three steps or tools that someone could grasp onto when they're in the midst of this situation and they, they finally realize I do need to change, something needs to change. They may not realize it's their perspective that needs to change. They might not have the awareness that I need to start thinking this way. They might just have the awareness something needs to change. So if they're in the midst of a really awkward or uncomfortable situation or in conflict, what are a few steps they could take initially just to help them start moving in the right direction? Well, first I would say of coming up with their own truth, of seeing you know what's going, that they're seeing something that they're having a hard time but it's coming up with their own truth. What is their truth, right? And then having the communication between the two people, really communicating with that other person. Communication is going to be important. I would say truth, knowing your truth and knowing their truth, your communication, their communication, and how we all communicate is very, very differently. Mm -hmm. So you have to you know, find out how do they communicate. And honoring each other, I would say honoring, you know, mm -hmm. when you have that person's perspective, well, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's wrong. Well, then you're just, dis that, you know, you're disallowing their own perception of something, their own truth, mm -hmm. right? So to speak, that could be their truth. So it's an honoring their own opinion of whatever that is. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say is knowing your truth, their truth, allowing each other to speak their truth of really what's going on here. So we have identified there's something very uncomfortable. I'm not, you know, we're not happy or maybe that one person is the other person isn't, but it's, you know, it's, it's really coming to the table and saying, you know, I've noticed this and you know, it's, I'm not really quite sure where you're coming from or what's happening with you, but you know, this is my, tr this is what's coming up for me. You don't have to say the truth, but you can say, this is what's coming up for me. And in that will be the truth and um, communication and then communicating, finding out how they communicate. You know, there's the book called the five love languages. Mm -hmm. It's a great book for anyone to read to find out what is your love language. Is it through, you know, uh, acclimates? Is it through physical? Is it through quality time? You know, there's just, that's so a it's really, book. yeah, it really is. And I, I, that would be a requirement. That's a requirement that I have everybody, you know, if you're going to be in relationship coaching to have that book and both, you know, to read it, mm -hmm. because it's good to know how you receive and how you give love and that's what that right. means. For you. Yeah. The mm -hmm. five love languages and the four agreements are two yes. of the, the best books. I yes. believe that have ever been written. What is when, okay. So when you're talking about finding your truth, speaking your truth, what you mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you mean, I believe is someone's truth is based upon their set of beliefs that we talked about earlier, where you're, you write out what your beliefs are based on your beliefs, based on your experiences, your filters, the way you perceive the world it's describing your reality, correct? Yeah, because, yeah, so, yeah, what you're doing is you're looking at what is true for you, you know, so how you have, um, really what makes you up, like what brings you joy, what are your beliefs, you know, what, what, it, what are your passions, how do you, how do you express yourself? These are all what's true for you, for you, and it is based upon our own experiences that we've come along, but some of that has been, you know, I want to say the word damaging, so to speak, mm -hmm. but, you know, and that's when we recognize, and that's where we can shift our perspective and realize, you know, um, oh, my father had abandoned me, and, um, but it's made me such a strong person. So I feel, you know, what I'm saying is, is, is really finding the positive in anything. I, I would say that with anything that happens in our life, every situation, every experience is finding the positive. Mm -hmm. And so that's also about the truth. When you look at the truth of what, you know, what is it about Angela? What is her truth? Like, who is she? You know, 
and what makes her tick? What makes her, you know, drives her? I think one of the fascinating things I've experienced in my lifetime is that changes over time. Absolutely. Because we change. We're constantly changing. Mm -hmm. I hope so, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, we are, definitely. I think that because when we're having a conversation, even though we may think we're not, I think we still, there's something because something's planted in there and it may be just in a word or it may be something, but I really do feel, people may say, oh, no, I haven't changed in Mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm, I wouldn't, I I would say no. There's, if you look back in your life and your timeline, Mm -hmm. you will see that you're not the same person. There's I, something different about you. Absolutely. I hope, yes, I hope to constantly be reinventing myself, changing, yes. learning, growing, evolving. Uh, to me, stagnation would be death. So I want to keep going. Yes. What is so a common fear that you come into contact with when you're dealing with people, coaching people, guiding people? What fear seems to come up over and over this pattern? And how do you help people overcome it? Mm. The, the uh, pattern of truth or um, being seen and heard or just a, any fear? A pattern of common fears. Or is mm. there? Are they all different? Or do you see a common one that keeps coming up over and over again? I would say... Mm, I would say the common fear is being seen of really showing up in life of who they really are. I think we all, you know, we, we put on these masks and um, we, we want to um, be something other than we are. Mm-hmm. You know, we kind of like we talked about the celebrities and, mm-hmm. you know, people seeing that and it's like, Oh, I want to be just like her. or I want to be just like him. And, you know, and, and we're so individually, so unique you know, that we beat to our own drum Mm -hmm. and that's the beauty of it, that we are so different. And so I would say that's the number one fear that I feel that people um, are afraid to be seen, afraid to show up who they are and how, what what I would say to that, how I would work with someone in that arena is diving deep within them to find and asking the questions. Mm -hmm. What drives you? What resonates with you? Mm -hmm. What are your beliefs? What are your joys? What are you passionate about? I think you're spot on with with the common fear being seen. I think that's one of the reasons they say a lot of people statistically fear public speaking more than they do fear dying because you are put in front of all of these people who are looking at you. And Mm -hmm. it's a huge fear for a lot of people. When I'm considering that situation, what it comes down to, as you were saying, people are, are have fear of being seen because that means being right. vulnerable and that means possible rejection. Absolutely. And it comes down to self-esteem. At the very core of it, it comes down to self-worth and self-esteem. Yep. And I find it. I I have also found that to be a challenge. I had that challenge at mm-hmm. at one time myself. I'm too mm-hmm. old for that now. I don't care. I am who I am. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> that, that's it. You, you take me mm-hmm. take me or leave me. It is what it is. I'm okay yeah. with that now. But I understand. I can empathize with people who have that fear of being who they are. It's oftentimes so much easier to play a role, as you said, to wear a mask, to pretend to be someone you're not, because there's no personal loss if someone rejects that persona. It's removed from you. But if you put yourself out there and you're rejected, oh dear, that's that's so challenging for people. Mm -hmm. But I would say to that, that this is where falling in love with you. Mm-hmm. When we can fall, and that's one of the first courses that I teach, is falling in love with yourself. Because when we fall in love with ourselves, then we show up as who we are. And it's like, you know what? Like you said, this is who I am. And you, either you take me or you leave me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've had rejection. It's sure. like, this is who I am. This is what, this is how I roll. And this is mm-hmm. what I love. And, and some people are like, that doesn't work for me. And I'm like, cool. Good to know it up right. front. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I, you hit on it earlier as well when you said 
when we show up as our true selves and we are in our own authenticity, we are at a frequency that is so strong and will resonate and we will shine a light that draws other people of that frequency, that resonance. And that's what we want to build upon Mm -hmm. and become okay with not being everyone's cup of tea. We don't have to please everyone. Right. Well, I think people, if they understand too, when you raise your frequency, magic, that's where the magic Mm -hmm. happens. Because you, if you're so, if your frequency is so high up there, you're not going to, you're not going to attract someone of a lower frequency. It's like when you get up in the morning and you're angry or you've had Mm -hmm. a bad morning, you'll notice throughout the day, that's how your day goes. Mm -hmm. If you wake up in the morning, you're happy and you're loving life. You're at a higher frequency. Things are going to happen. Doors are going to open. Calls, you're going to meet. The, you could meet the love of your life. Mm-hmm. That's where all the magic happens. So it's really important for us as individuals, as a humanity, to raise our consciousness, to yes. raise our frequency. And the only way to do that is to shift our perspective around what we see and to show up as ourselves, mm-hmm. to fall in love with ourselves, to be able to show up with, as ourselves. And when we do that, we're going to see a whole different world. We're going to see a whole different of us. And we're going to, you know, it's just going to be different. The vibe is going to be so much different. So give us one, two or three steps of what someone can do to fall in love with themselves. Mm. Love your body. Really, if uh, especially females. Um, really love the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, I would say being able to be transparent, to take risks, just to show up as who you are. Um, And that's going to really require of taking yourself out on a date, being able to be alone, um, really diving within yourself and finding out who you are, what makes you, you finding those joys, finding the passion within yourself. Um, and I don't know if guys would probably do this as much, but, um, I think guys are pretty easy with, Hey, you know, this is who I am. (laughs) I don't, think guys would really wear um and maybe they would i think there are some guys that probably would they're probably more on you know have a little bit more of the feminine and that they show more of that but um i feel it's more women that um about falling in love with ourselves and i would say men so i would say it's really being comfortable of being allowing yourself to be alone and taking those baths and really Buying the flowers for yourself, really, you know, taking yourself on a date, going for walks in nature and really being with you, honoring that um, that child within you. And I think this would be good for guys, too, to honor that child within them. Mm -hmm. Um, Exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah, all those aspects of really, really just looking at yourself, standing in front of the mirror and really looking at yourself. And anything that you see that you don't like, it's like, well, okay, I'm, I'm maybe, you know, 10 pounds overweight. So what can I do different? Okay, maybe I'll start eating differently. Maybe I'll go to the gym and, you know, doing th- little things like that. Or it may not even be that. Maybe you're look 10 pounds overweight, but you're like, hey, I, I love that. I love that about myself. I like being a little bit more voluptuous, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's also, too, our language around what we're saying. It could be, you know, people say I'm fat, right? That using that word that I am, that's going to be really important because then we we we're, we we are creating that right. So I would say use changing your language around you know when you're saying you're loving self like I love myself you know I am voluptuous and I love being voluptuous and you know not trying to compare or be like anybody else but really loving all those aspects of you but really taking yourself on a date doing things for yourself that you wouldn't even do you know. I love that. Uh, taking yourself on a date. I love that because that, that's all about taking time for, for ourselves as well. We tend to get so caught up 
in day-to-day rushing here, rushing there, doing this, doing that. We have our schedules entirely packed. We're constantly distracted with tweeting and beeping and alerts going off and alarms going off. So I think, you know, really taking time for yourself, taking yourself on that date, whether you're a man or a woman, really allowing yourself that time to connect with who you are and disconnect from all the harried, crazy, go, go, go rat race. It's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What are some of the greatest myths in perception and finding purpose? So when someone is working on perceiving the world around them or finding their purpose, what do you find to be some of the greatest myths out there around that? And them finding their purpose of what some myths are? I guess what I'm saying is where do people um, get stuck? Mm-hmm. I feel that people, if we're talking about purpose in life, I feel that people are getting stuck by listening to other people. Um, Listening to, you know, their parents are saying, well, I want you to go to school to be this and do that. This is what you need to be doing. And, um, you know, when we are listening to other people and following other people of what they think that's best for us, we do that. And I think that's a huge, um, you know, people get caught up in that and they get very stuck and then they, they hate their lives or they're just, you know, going through life. And to me, this goes back into falling in love with yourself when mm-hmm. you can say, this is what I love. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm going to do and not sacrifice yourself. So I feel that, especially when one's looking for their purpose of to find what makes them happy. It may not make their parents or you know, their husband or whoever else happy. But what's important is as long as it makes you happy, because in the end, all you have is you anyway. People are going to come and go in our life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so if we can do for our own, I think that's going to be really important. As far as the world and shifting and how people get stuck in the world, I feel is listening to the media, what's going on in the world, feeding all of that energy and realizing that if I keep continuing feeding that energy, I'm only going to create that of which I'm Mm -hmm. thinking about. Yes, absolutely. And I believe what you're talking about when you say it's time to wake up, there's a little bit of tough love there as well. It's, it's, we need to step up. Yeah. Well, in waking up, it's like, you know what? It's waking up to realizing, and this is hard for a lot of people. It was hard for me that I create my own reality. I'm like, Oh, you think there's no way, there's no (laughs) way I created this. Right. And I had to realize, guess what? Everywhere I go, there I am. No one forced me to get to where I'm at. And so, you know, it's time that we can have car accidents. We can have things, you know, our, our plumbing goes out, the water, you know, we get floods or we're evicted from our house or, Whatever's happening, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. These are all signs from the universe based upon, one, where are our thoughts trying to wake us up to say, hey, in this relationship, you're not happy. You you find your truth in that relationship. Mm -hmm. Make your choice and step out on faith and trust. And trust me, you'll be able to, you're going to be much better off or even in a career, you know, but you have to get to that truth first. So I think that, you know, people, we just get really stuck in this whole, you know, um, we just get caught up in what's going on and we, and we just, we don't allow ourselves to go, well, that may be the truth out there, but what's my truth within here? You know what I mean? And really focus on the good. Right. And you hit right on the premise as, as my listeners know, the whole entire premise of Transpersonal Radio is how our thoughts upload our reality, and th- it is so yes. true because what we think, what we speak, it defines our actions and what we do when we go out into the world, and our actions will define everything that happens around us, and that becomes our reality. So absolutely, when you are finding your truth it is so important to pay attention to your perception, your reality, and how you, not just 
what you're thinking, but what you want your reality to be, because then you can start putting your thoughts in that space. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have true awakening and, and really be able to shift consciousness, not just for ourselves, but for our communities and globally, eventually. Well, like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world, right? And so why wait until you get a two by four hit over your head, <laughs> right? You get evicted or you get into a major yes. car accident where mm-hmm. people, and that's where a lot of transformations happen when, and wake ups happen when people are stuck in a hospital for three months or they're, you know, laid up for three months and they're like, okay, is this all life has, you no know? And so, about it. yeah, you don't want to wait to that point. You know, when you start to get signs, and I think that's where it's really being present and staying in the now and really seeing what is happening in my mm-hmm. life and looking at all that's happening in my life, those are signs mm-hmm. to awaken you because it really is time for all of us to wake up that we do create our own reality. We can create a completely different reality by our thoughts and our words and really what we're attuning to, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Linda, thank you so much for sharing all of this great information with us tonight. Absolutely insightful and so much more. We could be talking for another hour easily. <laughs> Yes, how, thank you. How can people find you if they would like to learn more about who you are, what you have to offer, and uh, if they have questions about what we discussed this evening, what's the best way for people to reach you? They can reach me at my website, which is Linda S is in Sam Summers. That's S is in Sam U M M is Mary E R S dot com. So it's Linda S Summers dot com. Fantastic. And again, Linda, I just want to thank you for spending some time with us this evening and sharing with us some insight about how we can be seen and heard. Mm, Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks all the listeners that listened today, too. So thank you for having me on here, Angela. It was just really, truly a pleasure being here. My pleasure. And Transpersonal Radio listeners, as always, I will have the information in show notes on transpersonalradio.com so you will be able to visit Linda's website to find out more about Linda and the different programs she offers and all the wonderful work she's doing. Also, if you get a chance, be sure to go to Blog Talk Radio and look for her radio show. She is the host of Conscious Talk Radio. She's got a lot of listeners there, interesting topics, wonderful topics. She gets into relationships and all the, uh, a little bit more detail than, than what we were talking about this evening. This was just a tiny little taste of what Linda has to offer. So by all means, go check out what she's doing. Lots of great stuff. And as always, until next week, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Trans Transpersonal Radio. If you'd like to suggest a future future topic or be a guest, visit transpersonalradio.com. Call the hotline at 619-800-6057 or, or like our page, facebook.com slash transpersonalradio.